Today's chat was very inspiring. My guest is Brittany Hodak. She just released a book called Creating Superfans. It's a coincidence because we taped this the morning after the Super Bowl, which is like the ultimate celebration of super fandom with the commercials, with the NFL, with all that stuff. And we talked today about the recipe for creating super fans and its applicability to any business, even in those like B2B. Hi, Brittany. How are you? Good to see you. Hey, John. I'm doing great. Thanks. How are you? Doing good. Um, I've got your your book here, Creating Super Fans, which we're going to talk about today. And uh, and it, it's funny, we didn't plan this, but we're actually recording this the day after the Super Bowl, which we were joking about it a minute ago, which is like the ultimate celebration of super fandom and advertising and marketing. And, and it's really the ultimate super fan experience, right? All things super, yes. You know, I noticed last night with uh, with the commercials, there was a lot of of nostalgia. You know, there's the the Clueless movie. There's an homage to that. Uh, Serena Williams was giving a riff off of a of an Al Pacino speech for football. Um, why do you think that that advertisements are are tapping into nostalgia and and celebrities? You've got Ben Stiller pouring pouring Pepsi on his on his head. How does how does that have to do with creating super fans? In your opinion. Well, in my opinion, these brands are trying to borrow a little bit of the goodwill uh, of whatever the thing is that they're trying to make you nostalgic for. So I always say that super fans are created at the intersection of your story and every customer's story because you've got to connect your thing to their life. And so for a brand to say, oh, we're going to riff off of a movie that you loved or a TV show that you loved and try to make our product part of that story, they're trying to steal a little bit of that affinity. They're trying to, you know, endear themselves to you because they're like giving you a, a taste or a flashback of this thing that has impacted your life in some way in the past. Mm. And then, and then therefore I'm going to take that with me, uh, with, you know, choose Pepsi over Coke or, or whatever. Um, you know, yeah, it, it's like, you know, if you if you're like, oh, maybe if I'm friends with the cool kids, the other kids will think I'm cool. So like whatever it takes to get in with the cool kids, like then I'm going to be cool by association. Like that's totally the play yeah. when a brand does like a big celebrity cameo or nostalgia play with some sort of entertainment property of the Super Bowl. Talking about about cool kids, maybe that's a good a good segue. You were trying to be a cool kid as a youngster going to a Matchbox 20 concert, which you reference. <laughs> reference in your, in your book. I don't know whether you still consider that a cool kid experience. Um, and you talk about so, so many, so many experiences that are personal and important to you, whether it's being a University of Michigan fan, you know, you're going to have half the people listening to the pod giving thumbs up, me and others giving the thumbs down to that, or stepping into an elevator at, at Legoland. And all these experiences are super infectious because you talk about them, they become part of your identity, you want to consume more of them. Maybe your friends or acquaintances will do will also. What inspired you to to write a book on this topic? Well, I think I've always been obsessed with the idea of super fandom, always been really interested in branding and marketing and what makes someone sort of identify with a brand, what makes us opt into these these fandoms that we identify ourselves as being part of, whether it's, you know, in a very literal sense with pop culture or, you know, like a looser sense of feeling really loyal to certain brands at the exclusion of all others. And I worked in the music industry for much of my career. And so I saw fandom play out quite literally with people like buying concert tickets and buying merchandise and, you know, listening to, to songs and requesting songs on the radio. But when I went back to grad school and studied marketing and consumer behavior, I realized that it's the same switch. It's the exact same thing. The exact same markers that make us care about something in pop culture can make us care about a brand or a business or a service provider, because it's all about that overlapping intersecting point where that thing becomes relevant to your life. It becomes a part of your story. It becomes something that you now care about. It's no longer just like give me whoever is quickest or fastest or best. It's no, I want to work with 
fill in the blank. So I became obsessed with trying to figure out like, how do we bridge that gap? What do we do? What are the things that any brand can implement to make someone care about their product and service and the experience that it's wrapped in? Yeah, because that's that's what I want as a, a CMO. I want someone to love love my company or my product so much they tell others about it and they're sort of doing the selling for me. They're super fans of of Centerfield in in this case, you know. And as you talk in your book about about creating a story, you know, I was just the, the thing that came to mind is whenever I'm looking up a recipe online or I flip over the, you know, the kind of um, like farm to table beef jerky that I just bought at the store, there's, there's a, a, like a founding story or there's some type of story there that's intended to, to hook me in. And in certain cases, you know, like whether it's, it's food or some experience like travel, which we all can connect with when we're developing our own story, it, that feels natural. But let's say that you're listening to this, you're in, in an advertising services company like mine, or you're in B2B, or you're in a business turnaround. How do you start to cultivate your story? How do you create one if you don't know what it is? And you're, you're listening to this podcast. Oh, I love this story because I, or excuse me, I love this question because I feel like this is something that so many B2B brands get wrong or they've just never really thought about. And the reality is if you don't know why somebody should work with you, they are never, ever, ever going to be able to figure it out. And so many B2B companies like kind of sort of know the problem that they solve. They kind of sort of know uh, the clients that they're looking for. And then they hire all these sales and business development people who are like, oh yeah, I think we do this. I think we do that. We kind of do that. You've got to understand what it is that you're the best in the world at. Why does your company exist? What is the problem that you are solving for your prospects and your customers? Because if you can't answer that, they are never going to stand a chance at figuring out. And if you can't answer that, no one on your team is going to be able to answer it. Like you can't have, you know, 30 different people in your sales and marketing and ops department giving 30 different versions of your brand story and saying, you know, different things at different times to different people. That is a recipe for disaster because when that happens, when people aren't clear on your uniqueness, you become by definition a commodity right? And people may choose you if you're the most affordable or the fastest or the closest to their house or, you know, the one who emails them first, but that is not going to lead to long-term affinity. And it's certainly not going to lead to advocacy, right? Because you're not showing them why you want to like marry them instead of date them, right? Like it's, it's, it's not getting past that like commodity rung on the ladder, even if they, you know, even if they try it, they may not be adopting it long-term. Yeah. And so with, with that story, you know, um, how do you recommend that a marketing organization or a sales organization uh, taps into that, taps into that story or really gets it started? Like, like, is it, um, is it talking to customers? Is it getting on the whiteboard? Is it what, how, how would you inspire someone to, to start that? Yeah, well, it's a great question. Um, for anybody who gets my book, I have a whole resource library that I've set up on Kajabi with, uh, I call them, I call it a playbook, not a workbook because it sounds like more fun. So play sheets, I guess, rather than worksheets um, with exercises that you can go through. One of the exercises that works really well for smaller businesses is I say, imagine you're a reality TV producer and somebody, you know, this reality TV producer is trying to get people, your ideal customers to care about you in like 45 to 60 seconds. Like, you know, those home packages that we see when we tune into reality shows, what would they say? Like, what would they say to make somebody who had no opinion about you think, wow, I love that company. I want to know more about that company. I'm rooting for that company. And yes, absolutely. You should ask your customers. Absolutely. You should ask your employees. You should get feedback from everybody about what it is that they think is your secret sauce, because you'll hear things that perhaps, you know, you're not aware of. You've got a blind spot of, um, the other thing that you should do is realize that 
a recipe for disaster is trying to be all things to all people. Like you've got to be really clear on who it is that you want to serve and be the best in the world for them. Because again, if you're sort of just like, okay, forgettable to everybody, pretty soon your business will cease to exist, right? It's like, you know, the idea of there are very few three-star reviews for anything on the internet because people just don't take the time to say like, meh, it was okay. Like it was fine. It was forgettable. Like John, when's the last time you ate at a restaurant that was like just okay? And you told somebody like, hey, I ate at this new restaurant the other night. It was fine, right? Like we we That's exactly I mean I'm either going to complain big time about something X, Y, Z. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a big complainer, but you know, one, the 1% of the time you have a really bad experience or I eat at this place I love and I spend the next week telling everybody I know <laughs> that I, that I, I loved it. Yeah, that's, that's totally right. Um, and so, so that's sort of telling your, your own story. It's something that you've got to do as a brand. You have an acronym that you outline in the book, super S U P E R S S is, um, S is your story. And you then is understanding your customer's story. And you have a Venn diagram in the book about where your story and your customer story intersect. And that's what you really want to focus on. How, how do you, how do you start to do that, that part where you really understand your customer's story and where things intersect? Well, this is where it gets a little bit Inception-y, uh, like for anybody who has seen the, the the movie Inception, because I have an acronym within an acronym. So my supermodel, as you said, is the framework that um, sort of sets the stage for customer experience and why it should be the number one focus for every leader um, who wants to create a, a sustainable brand. But the U, which stands, as you said, for understand your customer story, story is a secondary acronym. And that is, what is your customer struggling with? What's the transformation that they hope to undergo? What other options are on the table? What reservations may they have about working with your brand or business? And then finally, the why is you. Are you the right choice to serve them? And if not, you should absolutely say so. That's a, you know, a topic for another day that I talk about in the book. Um, but really understanding like what is that transformation that your customer is looking for? Not just the surface transformation, but what's driving the need for something to be different in their life. Because when you can connect with someone on a level where they very clearly understand what it is that you're doing to make their life different and better, that's when they care. That's when you overpower that apathy. And all of a sudden, they care about you and your thing because they know that you care about them and their thing. Yeah. And I, I want to go back to B2B because so so often this can, be, this can be challenging for B2B companies is understanding someone that might want to buy your HR software versus someone else's HR software or your advertising product and some, instead of someone else's advertising product is understanding someone's struggle and what they what they really want to change at the end of the day and sometimes that can be personal sometimes it can be i want to be promoted sometimes there's this there's this challenge within the company that just talking about your features is not going to not going to address and so um what what's a way or what are some tips that you can provide where someone trying to think about someone else's story, you're not like pontificating about it. You're actually going and really getting into a customer or a prospect's motivation. How do you, how do you research this? How do you truly understand it? Well, so research is a component, but it's really about active listening. It's about having the curiosity and the empathy to lead with the questions that help you get to know people on a deeper level, of course, in appropriate settings and, and you know, at appropriate stages of the relationship. Um, and so in B2B, I always think of, do you remember, John, the first time you saw one of your teachers outside of oh, school yeah. when you were a kid? <laughs> and did it like right. break your brain? Yeah, because... Uh, <laughs> 
It's totally out of, out like, of context. You can almost have like a weird deja vu moment. Right. You're like, yeah. wait, you get to like leave school, right? It like freaks you out um, because as a, you know, six-year-old, seven-year-old, you only think about your con- your teacher in that context of like who they are to you. Like they're just your teacher. And you don't think about the fact that this is like a human with a life and a family who like goes home after the bell rings um, because it's just like not relevant to you as, as a kid. And I feel like a lot of people take take that same mindset into their job, especially in the B2B roles. Like they don't think about the human that is occupying this role. They just think about the title. They just go on LinkedIn. They look at the, um, you know, they look at the like resume and they're like, okay, I'm talking to John. John is the vice president of HR for XYZ Corp. And like, they don't know or care that John loves lacrosse and, you know, hockey and, you know, whatever else about John. So like taking the time to get to know the human and to make yourself known as a human is again, where you can create an intersection of your story and theirs. Oh, you've got two young kids. I've got two young kids. Oh, you love skiing in Tahoe. I love skiing in Tahoe. And what happens is you get to know people. And now all of a sudden you're more than just, you know, a person behind an email address for XYZ company. So connecting your story to theirs. If you want people to be passionate about your thing, you've got to give them a reason to. You've got to show them why they should care. And people don't buy products. They certainly don't buy features and benefits. They buy relationships. They buy people. They buy the experiences that things are wrapped in. And so it's critical to remember you are in the experience department. Every single person on your team is in the experience department. And whether you're at the very top of the funnel or you're dealing with a customer who's been a customer for 15 years, you are responsible for either the first sale or the next sale. Even if it doesn't say sales on your resume, like you are responsible for whether or not that's going to happen because of the impression that somebody has about your brand based on the interactions. You know, I thought of one other situation, kind of like the teacher, but it's more, it's more for me at this age. I saw my uh, primary care doctor at the airport. (laughs) That was the one that was like, that one totally broke my brain. We're like, we're like both in TSA pre-check together. It was, it was too much for me. Um, You, you hit on something as, as you were, you were talking around personalization, which is the P in your acronym. And so like uh like personalization i see is is done well sometimes and it's it's not it's not done well like for me i get a lot of personalized linkedin messages that put personalized in quotes i'm a, i'm a marketer a lot of people want to sell folks like me stuff and um and almost like rely on things that are public information to me to try to to try to connect with me um and that's not really necessarily like where I am right now, where I'm, where if, if, a, if a stranger is going to reach out to me, you know, the fact that they know X, Y, Z about me is as creepy sometimes as it is personal. And so like, um, like, are there other ways that you see personalization go, go right or wrong? I mean, for me, I'll just t- tell anyone who wants to market to me, make your email like as short, sweet, and to the point as possible. Because if you're if you're kind of getting at a problem that I have, I'm going to respond to you. Almost nothing else is going to work for me. So um, t- anyway, I, what, what are your what are your thoughts on how to do personalization right? Well, I'm so glad you asked this question because there are so many people who do it wrong, as you said. Um, and I actually, I, t- I tell a story in the book that reminded me of all of those like unsolicited LinkedIn messages and like cold outreach emails. I was, it's been probably about a year ago now. I was in a mall in Las Vegas and I was walking and I like accidentally made eye contact with one of the vendor cart people in the middle of the mall, which, you know, like once you make eye contact, it's over. And I'm walking by and this woman says to me, wow, you're really pretty. And in my head, I was like, oh my gosh, like she's what a like lovely, nice compliment. But like, that wasn't the end of the sentence. And what she actually said was you're really pretty for sun for someone with so much sun damage on her face. And I was like, it, like I totally stopped walking because I was like, you know, in my head, I was like, wow, that took a turn really fast. And I was like trying to figure it out. And she like went into her spiel about like, you know, 
whatever cream that she was trying to sell. And I was just like, honestly, really confused. And I was like, are, are you, are you talking about my freckles? Like wh- what? And she said, honey, once you're 30, they're not freckles anymore. They're age spots and they aren't cute. And I just like kind of looked at her and I was like, I like my age spots and I just like kept walking. Um, But in my head, I was like, what a jerk. But it reminded me of all those LinkedIn messages that you get in all those emails that are like, hey, I came across your website and it is fantastic, except for this one thing that totally sucks and is terrible. But lucky you, that's exactly what my company does. And if you hire me today, we can fix it and you won't be like the embarrassing scourge of the internet anymore. Like, so you're right. Fake personalization is in many instances worse than no personalization at all because it can come off as really tone deaf. It can come off as really offensive or creepy, as you said. Um, So yes, personalization is important. But what I mean by personalization and what I talk about in the book is treating people the way they want to be treated. So you just said you want short emails, short to the point. Someone else might want long, drawn out voicemails, right? Somebody else might want to communicate like in a totally different way. So understanding how your customer wants you to show up for them, asking questions about their preferences, about, you know, what's going to make things feel really great um, to them. Because when that happens, people are going to say, wow, they're so easy to work with. That was so easy. And that's what you want people to say about you, obviously, because when something is easy, when something feels really natural, people come back. Um, and, and then in addition to personalization, you also talk about exceeding someone's expectations, which is the E and why, and why that can be a thing that's like super infectious. Um, this is going to date me in a serious way, but, but, uh, but one of the things that was amazing, someone's kind of silly to talk about. I remember booking um booking the airline tickets like in the late 90s and um and southwest airlines was was this groundbreaking company that they answered your phone call right at like immediately um which was a shock and were super amazingly friendly and were quirky on flights over the phone and it's something that if you if you dug it was so much better than anyone what anyone else did and it was like this really groundbreaking experience you talk in your book you give an example about a hotel and this is a totally different example but like that has a popsicle phone <laughs> can you i hadn't heard of it when i saw it in your book can you explain this example and then what you mean about exceeding expectations Yes, absolutely. So um, the the Magic Hotel um, has um, this popsicle hotline where you can pick it up and you can request somebody bring you a popsicle and somebody dressed in like, you know, white gloves will come out with a silver platter and give you a popsicle. And it's just like one of those silly, fun things that you remember. So In the book, I talk about this idea of intentional experience design and being able to elevate any interaction into an experience, into a moment that matters, that your customers are going to remember and that they're going to talk about and tell their friends about. So I love the Southwest example that you shared, um, like a fun Southwest touch point for me that elevated something into a memory was the first time my husband, Jeff, and I were flying with our son, Cato, and he was just a few months old. So he was a lap infant. And when you have a lap infant traveling with you, you have to like check in at the desk and show them the birth certificate. And then they give you like a little printed out like special boarding pass for the for the baby um now my son is five and he's sneezing over on the other side of the room if you hear that because he snuck in here um so Cato is five now and every time we fly I think about the first time that we checked in at that southwest uh desk because they had everyone who was working that day sign a certificate that said Kato Hodak, thank you for flying with us on your very first flight. And they wrote the flight number. They wrote the destination city. They wrote the date. It was so cool. It was like this cute little thing saying, welcome to the you know Southwest family. Um, and so little things like that, that don't cost a lot of money, that make your employees happy and your customers happy because they're creating a moment. So one of the things about creating like an amazing differentiated experience is you want, you want to try to like understand 
how customers are reacting to it. However, I, I as, a, as a customer, some brands that I like are constantly bombarded with surveys. You know, how is, how is this, how is this phone call? How is this hotel? How is this? And it's all, it's almost like a, these brands that are trying to understand me are asking for a lot. I don't, I do a fair amount of business travel. I don't want to spend 45 minutes every week telling people everything. So like, so like, I, yes. so, so like what, what's a way, is this just, does this just go, do you file this in the, in the area of like, you got to understand everything about the, the experience that a customer has, or is it more about figuring out better ways to truly understand if that, if the popsicle phone or the, or the, the example of, of, um, of your kid's first flight, if those things are truly impactful, finding a different way to do that. Love, love, love that you asked this question because I also have lost patience for people who ask questions that are not relevant or not relevant to me. And I think we've gone way too far to this idea of everybody saying like, oh yeah, I'm going to have them, you know, take an NPS survey or I'm going to ask them 50 questions about their flight and 42 of them aren't going to be relevant. So I think you have people who don't want to take surveys anymore in part because they're not being respected respectful of their time. And also because a lot of times it feels like as a customer, somebody is asking about your experience because they want to improve things for the next customer. And as a customer, sometimes we feel a little selfish of like, well, no, we want you to make things better for me. Like, I'll tell you about my experience if you're asking in real time because you want to make things better for me while I'm here. Like, if you want to send me a text while I'm still at your hotel to ask how things are going because you want to, like, you know, bring me some cheesecake from room service or whatever, that's one thing. But when you send me a 42-question survey two weeks after I left, then that feels very self-serving on the business's part, right? So I think it's a few it's a few sort of bad habits here that businesses have fallen into in part because it's so easy to measure things these days. It's, you know, there's so many companies that exist just to help you capture this first party data. So I think one thing to do is never, never give your customer survey fatigue, like never ask them something for the sake of asking it. Never ask them for feedback that you're not prepared to act on. I mean, the minute you collect that survey information, you should be looking for ways to put it into practice. You should not be letting some outside company collect it for an entire quarter or six months before they share in aggregate with you, like, here's what your 50,000 customers said. Because again, then you're just looking at the like 10,000 foot view. You're not treating every customer as an individual. And of course, people will say, oh, well, if we don't talk to everyone, like how are we going to capture just, you know, the few that had a really bad experience or the few that like want to recognize somebody, those people will find a way to get in touch with you. Like asking like big blanket surveys are not the ways you find and discover problems. You find and discover problems by empowering your frontline employees to listen, to have real conversations, to be on the lookout for opportunities to fix a problem in real time, create a wow moment to get someone more endeared to your brand. And also by social listening, like people are talking about your brand. They're having conversations about it on social media. They're oftentimes using uh, social media for complaint resolution, um, for help elevating things that they haven't been able to get resolution on faster. So doing, you know, like a long form survey to every single customer who completes an order because someone whose job it is to sell you survey products told you that's a good idea is not a best practices in many cases for many businesses. So is this, is this what you mean um, when you're empowering frontline employees to solve a situation, is this what you mean by retain and relay the information? That, that's the R in your acronym, or do you mean something else? So uh, R actually stands for repeat. Oh, repeat. And yeah, and what I mean by repeat is customer experience is not a set it and forget it. This is not something that you do one time. You win your customers' hearts and minds by being excellent again and again and again, because as uh, Elizabeth Arden once said, repetition makes reputation and reputation makes customers. But to your question, yes, it is incredibly important that frontline employees 
feel that they have a voice in the organization because an apathetic employee is never going to create an engaged customer. They can't, they don't, like it does not happen. Um, every employee, as I said before, is in the experience department. And whether or not an organization has a chief experience officer, it's vital that they have someone filling that role, even if they don't have someone with that title, who is helping make sure that all of the great feedback that's happening in those touch points between employees and customers makes its way up to the boardroom, makes its way up to a seat at the table in any meeting where you know customer decisions are being made or decisions about products are being made on behalf of customers because those frontline employees are the ones who know like they're the ones having the conversations like they are the reputation of your uh, of your company but they're also like the focus group like the keeper of information about your company so yes retaining reporting and acting on that real time research and feedback that you're getting is critical to being able to improve those customer experiences in real time or close to real time, not at the end of every quarter where there's like a big debrief on the, you know, 17 million data points that were collected over the past, you know, 120 days. Brittany, let me end here. Um, given that that your book and the topic of really today's conversation has been has been about being a super fan, are you a super fan of any brand that you want to tell the world about the, the, the millions of people listening to this podcast? Well, there are several brands that I'm a super fan of. Um, one that I really love, and I know they have a lot of super fans, um, is Chewy. I love Chewy.com. And in the book, I tell a story of how they took me from total apathy. I was like, it's dog food. Who cares? It's the same everywhere to wow, I want to give all my money to this company. Just like, take my money, you can have it all. And the reason that I love talking about Chewy uh, is not just because they've they've earned a reputation for using personalization and surprise and delight and going above and beyond, but also because of the category they operate in. Like if people can be passionate about where they buy medicine and toys and treats and food for their pets, that's like literally exactly the same products everywhere. Like if somebody can differentiate themselves in a market that is that much of a commodity. It just shows that everyone can, whether you're a brand new small business or, you know, a brand that's been around for, for decades or even centuries with tens of thousands of employees by being intentional about the experiences that you design and deliver for your customers, you can stand out. You can go to that, you know, category of one headspace and create loyal, enthusiastic super fans who come back and tell their friends to do the same. Thanks, Brittany, so much for the conversation today and for being on the pod. Thanks so much for having me, John. This was a lot of fun.